times. So you know, with the liquid bomb plot, I think they, you know there were there were multiple planes and of the order of about two thousand people that were at risk who were who, who were saved by by that that plot being foiled. But um, an example where there was a failure in a border system that could have been solved by AI is the, um, the Boston Marathon bomb. Welcome to Needle Stack, the podcast for professional online research. I'm Jeff Phillips, your host. And I'm Aubrey Byron, producer and co-host. Today, we're continuing our discussion around AI and OSINT with a discussion about the role of AI in border security. Uh, this should be a great topic. And joining us for the discussion is Declan Trezice, Vice President of Global Solutions Engineering at Babel Street. Declan, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Thank, thanks, Aubrey. Appreciate you uh, taking the time with me today. Yeah, it's been a really interesting last couple of episodes. Obviously, our artificial intelligence is uh, a hot topic these days. But before we dive in, to start us off, um, and for those that don't know, can you tell us a little bit about Babel Street and your role with the company? Okay, yeah, absolutely. So Babel Street is a company with, um, with a, a great heritage working with government organizations, agencies, intelligence, law enforcement, and also large commercial enterprise customers. We deliver technology that allows investigators and uh, people involved in, in, um, in solving and, and helping uh, difficult te technological problems in the, the security domain, in the intelligence domain. And um, it revolves around OSINT that we're going to talk about a little bit later, but also around providing um, very competent AI uh, components that can deliver kind of point solutions and help solve very difficult problems, things that we're going to talk about in, in border control. Um, but yeah, understanding human language, analyzing language and text, and uh, providing insights for, uh, for, for analysts. Well, you talked a little bit about, um, you mentioned border control. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the tool is utilized by countries in terms of border control? Yeah, absolutely. So we we actually work with some some large, well developed Western countries in helping them secure the border, and we do that by providing a capability to screen and check names of people as they enter and exit the country. Now, this sounds like it might be a, a relatively straightforward problem. You think, okay, a name is a name, but um, I think I'll probably go into a bit more detail about how a name isn't just a name, and you want to combine name with other biographic information in order to check whether it's on a watch list or a no-fly list, or you know, it could even be a terrorist watch list. Um, so yeah, we, we solve that problem currently. Yeah, can you, backing up a minute, just give us a little bit of an overview of a modern border management and what the challenges are? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I first got involved with thinking about borders back in 2015. Uh, I've been um, working with a number of people across the UK Home Office, and actually they are a customer of ours when it comes to uh, the capabilities that I talked about, screening names at the border. Um, and over that time, uh, I think I've, I've spoken to several experts in, in the field, worked very closely with them. And you know, my, my information is, is secondhand, but I've been oper you know, around, around these operations and I've been delivering solutions to help. Um, really, what, what, what is a border? Okay, you look at a border and it's very much about, what's it for? Well, it's, it's, it's there to facilitate the, the free travel of, of you know, innocent people that are going about their business, trying to improve the economic prosperity of their, their country, um, maybe through, through trade and, and through, through cargo, but also you know, travelers for, for pleasure, travelers for business. Those are really, you know, 99.9% .9 of all travel is, is completely innocent and well-intended. Now, um, your border has to facilitate that as swiftly, smoothly, as efficiently as possible. But also it's there as, as, as a security measure. It's there to prevent the bad actors from passing over, prevent the bad actors from uh, being in a place where they can commit crimes and atrocities that, that we don't want. But also there are bad actors that are, are bringing illicit cargo, um, smuggling people, uh, amongst other things that are, are not good. So your border must, must be able to reject those people and identify them efficiently too. So that's what a border is for. Now, when it comes to kind of an integrated approach to border management, 
you need to look at it from a, a few different angles. So um, really, if you can prevent somebody crossing your border before they get there, that is a, is a, is a great help. And if there's information sources that, that allow you to get that information in advance, you can prevent the traveler leaving their destination, then your border is, is, is working effectively. So pushing the border out is, um, is a key uh, feature of integrated border management, using intelligence before somebody even travels. Um, now, part of the integration, though, is, is, is getting data shared and visible and usable in time um, f across many different uh, uh, agencies and, and and um, producers and consumers of data. So an integrated border wouldn't just be a single isolated uh, um, agency or, or organization. They'd have to work in concert with, with other borders, and they'd have to work with uh, uh, you know, their, their, their local defense security and intelligence agencies to, um, to make sure they have up to minute information. And that yeah, then has to get to the border guard so that they can make effective decisions. So it's the, the integration of, of people, organizations, agencies, and then it comes down to the, the problem of identity. So when you have people at the border correctly identifying who they are and comparing that against the, the sources of data that, that you have. So yeah, several, several aspects of you know, integrated border management need to be in place to, to be effective. That's super interesting. Um, you know, for the, the last several episodes of the podcast, we've been talking about artificial intelligence and this podcast is about OSINT. Um, and so can we, and now we're talking about border security and, and I can picture in my mind a little bit of how that might all connect, but can you tell us about how OSINT or publicly available information um, and, and the link to AI is all used in border security? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I, I've been around OSINT since before it was known as OSINT. So in my, in, in my early years as, as a technologist, I, I worked on um, on projects for for collecting information and um, for making that usable and actionable. Um, OSINT, as as we understand it, is is open source intelligence. It's it's intelligence from from sources that are available either publicly or, or commercially, and that could be anything. It could be um, yeah, websites. It could be social media, uh, or it, yeah, it could be information that you can buy from uh, uh, an organization that collates and um, and organizes it. But um, fundamentally, it's yeah, it's data that's out there, out there on, on the internet. Now, without some degree of artificial intelligence, you're not really going to be able to find something that, that that's key and and um, valuable for your um, uh, for your border to mitigate the risks in in a timely way. You know, you could have hundreds of analysts uh, on every single border trying to manually scour the internet, and they're not really necessarily going to find the risks that we are. Uh, we're worried about. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a set of analytics tools that can find the correct data, but then also refine it down to the, the bits that are of, of, of interest. So identifying the people and the associated risk that goes alongside them. So OSINT would, would be a, a great source of a huge amount of information, but without the, the analytics tools that are often AI fueled that sit on top, you're not gonna be able to, to see the risks that are there. Um, and this could be things that, yeah, it could be analytics AI that, that runs across video content or yeah, something that more, is more close to my heart associated with things I've been working on for, for nearly 10 years now is, is looking at uh, text data. So we publish and write so much text on the internet, uh, whether it's social media postings on, on Twitter or whether it's, you know, it's blogs, whether it's um, um, yeah, instant messages uh, between people. Um, you cannot have a human read and understand all that. So what we want to do is get to the point where we have AI, and by that, by which I mean language models. Um, it could be small models. It could be, you know, the, the, with the emergence recently of things like ChatGPT, it could be large language models, uh, things that can read and understand text across multiple languages and um, pull out things of interest or even answer questions against that data for a, in a summarized way. So. Um, that's that's where we look. We look at the, the convergence of, of OSINT and and um, and text analytics and natural language processing to do smart things for for yeah the border security. And and as I've gone across borders and do that super fast, timely as they take my name off my passport, being able to do yeah. that quickly as you go through. Okay. 
sifting through. So the, uh, your, 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 name has, your name will come off the passport, Jeff. And um, they, they also need to, to know a little bit more about you because there's probably several Jeff Phillips out there. And there's probably several ways of spelling Jeff, right? You, you spell it with a J, but, but somebody might spell it with a, with a G. So it's, it's first of all, making sure you've got the right person and then making sure that the information that you're screening against is, is up to date and, and, and shows the right risks. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about that name matching technology and how it works? Yeah, it's um, it's it's something that I I talk about often. So yeah, stop me if I go to go too long. <laughs> the um, it, it all starts with the idea that that we imagine that matching a name is a simple thing to do. If the name is on the list, then it's a hit. But we we as humans and working with technology introduce all kinds of complexity into names all the time and uh, mistakes can be made or it could even be that a name is 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 perfectly correct in the way that it's written but it's just not the way that you would write your name and um, complexities are, are added when we we take a name and we try and stuff it into a format that a machine can understand so we'll split it and break it um, we we will miss parts out you know you might lose your middle names and they become an initial or you know, your, first, your last name might get put first in front of your first name. So by, by working with machines, we introduce complexity. And then a big layer on top is, is, is all about language. So we are, we're speaking the same language for the most part. Uh, you know, my, my, we might have a, uh, the Atlantic Ocean between us. But for the most part, when I say something, you'll, you'll understand how to uh, write that word down. You'll understand what that word means. But when you move between two languages, there's... Um, as a, a layer of fuzziness that, that's added automatically because no two languages map directly. And then um, there can be various interpretations as to how you would write somebody's name. And if you're coming from something like uh, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, or, or Arabic, for example, their, their alphabets have nothing in, in common with the Latin alphabet that we use in, in Europe. So um, there are adaptations and standards that, that some people stick to, but other people use different ones. So names can become more complex as you move from language to language. And any, any system that's going to understand checking names, screening names, mapping them, is, is going to have to deal with all the complexities that we introduce just from yeah. communicating names between us. And then um, yeah, the ways that they can be, be complicated and the phenomena of, 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 of different name variations that get introduced in those processes. That's fascinating. Um, another thing that came up was fuzzy name matching. Um, can you go into a little bit about that? Yeah, f fuzzy. Fuzzy is a slightly worrying term, right? We <laughs> uh, now we try and, and add on the word smart at the same time when we talk about it. So you want it to be smart and fuzzy, um, <laughs> not not just fuzzy. Um, fuzzy is how how we think about uh, two names that we're checking, or so a name versus a watch list, or a name versus a passport. You know, to verify them, we want to see, okay, it's not just a binary answer as to yes or no, does this match? It's about having a, some fuzziness in terms of how much the, the names overlap and um, how confident we can be that they're, they're the same or similar. So there's, so if, yeah, if I see my name written with my first name spelled incorrectly and my middle name missing, um, I can be reasonably confident they're the same, maybe 80% confident that, that, that those two names are the same. But what we have is a degree of fuzziness that lets us say, yes, I think that above a certain confidence threshold, I'm going to accept that these are the same, rather than just uh, um, rather than just yeah, the binary yes or no. Of okay, so now if if I put myself, uh, and from what you've seen, but if I put myself in the shoes of, a, of, of border agents, you know, how do you see artificial intelligence, AI powered tools such as Babel Street, you know, how's it assisting that border agent on the ground? Okay, so this is, this is uh, great. So I, I have in my head the, uh, the idea of your, the, the perfect border. Okay, so what, what's, oh, the perfect border? You know, what's the perfect border look, 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 look like? The perfect border looks like completely frictionless, seamless travel. You, you, you park your car, you walk in the airport, you get on your plane, you know, you fly for five hours and, the, and then you get off and, and at no point were you stopped or interrupted or hindered in your, in, in, in your, in your travel plans. Now that, that, would be, that would be ideal, but how, would we, how do we get there? And we get there by, by, by doing not just, just one thing, it's not just introducing 
you know, an AI agent in, in the middle. It's, it's by, um, by having kind of a comprehensive uh, approach to it. So usually when you, you book a flight, um, you'll do it in advance. You'll do it maybe you know, a couple of weeks in advance. And at that point, you are, you're providing information uh, to the airlines who then provide it to the, the local law enforcement. They provide it to, to intelligence agencies. You know, all of that, all of those systems currently exist. Um, we call that advanced passenger information. And, and that enables some pre-screening to happen. Uh, so, yeah, potentially, you know, you, you could even be part of a trusted travel pro pro program, sorry, where you, um, you, you basically give more information up front to allow more seamless travel. And, th and those programs already exist. You know, there are uh, people who can travel from the UK to the US. If they do that frequently. They'll be on one of these trusted traveler programs. Um, so, yeah, giving information in advance helps agencies screen in advance and helps you be fast tracked potentially if you are yeah, you know, traveling between countries. Um, but there will also be times when somebody wants to travel without making plans far in advance. So what would we do to get the information to help us pre-screen them? We might, we might look at um, their behavior, the things that they do on the internet. We might look at the, the, the information that they make publicly available uh, about themselves out there and maybe have that fed into a system that can do some kind of intelligent uh, targeting, screening, and, and um, you know, fast-tracking process. So yeah, if we, if we know who somebody is, maybe they, you know, they drive their, their car up to the airport they get off near the terminal, maybe there is an integrated system between law enforcement, a highways agency that identifies the car, who the person is, and says, okay, are they somebody that we already know is going to travel? Or are they somebody that we think could, um, you know, could be about to travel and then kick in a screening process? So we want to make it seamless so that somebody that approaches such an environment can be screened before they, they get through the door. And then we need some degree of understanding who they are when they're, you know, when they're walking through the airport so that the right person doesn't get, get pulled aside. So we want to minimize the number of interventions that, that a, a, um, a border control guard would have to uh, take. So, um, yeah, is, can we use a combination of you know, biometrics? So we willingly give our biometric information up when we cross the border. I'm you know, traveling into the United States. I, um, you know, the first time I went there, I had to give my fingerprints. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, traveling in Asia, you know, I, I'll give iris scans or I'll give face, face scans that allow me to come through quicker in, in future. So those, those, those capabilities are getting, um, getting stronger all the time. And obviously, AI algorithms sit behind the, the recognition of the biometrics that, that happen. So yeah, if you can identify who somebody is um, as they approach, do a pre-screening, identify who they are as they walk through an airport, then you're 90% you're, you're of the way there in making this ideal border scenario. And in the background, you have an AI-powered risk engine that assesses the level of risk associated with that person, um, whether it's uh, someone on the watch list and you check their name, or that you 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 don't have a watch list and that the watch list is generated on the fly based on risk factors that exist in the publicly available information that, that that's out there at the time. So, yeah, uh, almost a, um, a just-in-time uh, risk check. So you're not necessarily depending on something, but that all of these things you can see require a large amount of coordination between uh, providers of, um, of, of the information, consumers of, of, of information, law enforcement, intelligence, mm -hmm. and, um, and the airlines as well. Or, you know, it could be the shipping lines. You know, we haven't even, haven't even mentioned the idea of, of, of um, you know, people traveling across land borders or sea borders carrying large amounts of goods either way. Uh, I didn't even think about that as well as... <clears throat> That's your point. Goods are just shipping and um, what's going on there. So yeah. with, with everything you mentioned there, I mean, do you see AI um, as being able to augment current efforts and efforts and, and plug into places? Or does does what you're talking about require a complete change in the way borders are, are, are managed? Is this a, a complete overhaul? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good question, Jeff. I like, I like that one. So it's... It's what's the, what, what's currently happening, and then what what might be in in the future is, is the way I look at it. Well, actually, also in the in the past. So many countries will have existing legacy systems. They'll be sitting on huge piles of data that don't actually exist in an integrated fashion. Um, you know, the worst of it might be paper tickets, reports, uh, passenger manifests 
uh, things like this that 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 aren't accessible or, or digitized. So um, you know, and, and countries that have been operating as 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 ports of entry or or transit um, venues, they they will have a huge amount of historic information where there might be trapped value. So um, legacy systems, even in, in you know that are digital, won't always be connected, and they, that can be a, a problem. Um, right now the places that we see AI being implemented is really kind of point solutions. So it's it's the algorithm that, that checks the name, or it's the algorithm that, that that looks at the iris scan and makes a determination, or the one that, that works with the fingerprint. So it's a, a point solution for AI here and a point solution for AI there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and although people get excited about it, it's not a holistic thing. It's not um, the you know the the ultimate um, large um, large model for for borders. So you know we have large large language models now where everybody's becoming very entertained by those, and you know we're thinking about the the way they might apply. But ultimately, once once you can move away from legacy systems and stop thinking about point solutions, that's where you can um, you think okay, really we want a, a risk model that that's gonna gonna be holistic and and consider all all aspects of data pertaining to, to border travel, transit, you know, the flow of people and goods uh, across borders. And then once we have that, that model developed, we can ask it novel questions around the risk of individuals, uh, companies, et cetera, and, um, and make determinations. So that, that's, that's ideally where maybe it would go. Um, now, there, there are developing countries that, that potentially can skip the step around legacy systems. So, um, you know, if, you, if you've never had an integrated border system or you've never had uh, an attempt at making a, a border management system with, with, you know, with your historic data, then maybe you're in a better position to start from scratch um, and not have to, to rely on that. And I think that's quite novel. So, I, you know, I work, um, work with, with, with Tony Smith. He's um, the, um, the chairman of, of, of IFMATA, so the Integrated uh, uh, Border Management um, Association. Mm. Uh, he was former director general of, of UK Borders, and and um, in my dealings with him, uh, you know, he's he's been been absolutely um, invaluable in, in in understanding some of the the processes around the UK border when I've been working with the, the Home Office. But um, he often travels and, and holds events in different countries uh, where, where who are at different stages in their border management journey, and and some of the more um, more agile uh, nations tend to be those that. that are developing a, a new border management from a system from scratch. Um, ultimately, everybody still uh, raves about the fact that, that that the U.S. has the best border. Um, you know, they, they 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 tend to do things. They don't tend to do things by halves. You know, U.S. combined you know, customs and border protection into a single agency, and from there they they took a view that was you know, integrated from, from the start. Um, I can see other countries looking at going in that direction too. I'd, I'd like I like the ideal. Sorry, sorry, I like the ideal scenario you talked about, right? <laughs> yeah, I think we all do, right? That's what we all want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're a country looking, I guess, to set up a new system or how you can improve, what kind of technical and ethical considerations are there for taking this approach? So. Uh, I, I'm very much the technologist, Aubrey. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the one to, to give you the, the ethical view very much. But I think that we do all, all worry that we're giving away too much information about ourselves all the time. And it's, um, it's a transaction that we make. So to, to what degree do you want to, to give away your, your personal information uh, for the sake of um, improving your, your passage through a border? Well, yeah, I think everyone has to, to make like a, an individual decision ab about that. But um, you know there there is there's a lot of information out there publicly available, and maybe we're we're not necessarily aware of how much we've already given away. So um, you know, it, it, I, I ask you, you know, feel free to reach out to to, to Babel Street, and, and some of my colleagues will, will maybe show you what what can be um, can be found about you out there on the, um, in the in the publicly available information. But yeah, we we give away a lot of information, and um, yeah, we. We, to a degree, should should have control of how much of our personal information we give away, but yeah, it becomes a transaction as to how much we're prepared to give away to facilitate our own um, travel. That's not to say that if, if if somebody is unwilling to provide personal information, that they are in fact a risk. I think I, you know, I never go so far as to, to look at it like that. 
there's a lot of reasons why somebody might not want to give away their, their personal information. Um, sorry, what was the, the other aspect of your question? I guess for countries looking to set this up, um, mm -hmm. and to your point though, I think that, uh, you know, part of that giving away is sometimes means maybe you give away more information, but you have TSA pre-check now and you get to pass yeah. it more quickly through. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if, if countries are looking to adopt more AI in their approach, how would they, how would you recommend they start going about that? So, um, I think it's, it's look at what the, the thought leaders in the space are, are doing and, um, and think, okay, how do we, we adopt that, but also, you know, build, build on top of that. So, um, you know, my, my personal, you know, Inf uh, personal prioritization is is around improving screening of passengers uh, against against watch lists. You know, you can um, you can make everything easier for everyone if if only the people that are genuine threats are, are pulled aside. So having a, uh, an optimal screening system that doesn't doesn't deliver false positive um, alerts is is got to be high on, on the list. This is um, you're, you're going to be able to make the most of your border guards if they're not pulling over every every tenth person um you know if every t yeah, it's it, for a single airport you could have hundreds and hundreds of, of false positive uh, alerts every single day um so yeah getting getting better at that you know a point solution that can that can improve your your screening uh reduce your false positive alerts and mm -hmm. still make sure that you don't miss those those true positive alerts there's absolutely you know real risks um is 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 key um so yeah i'd say go go that way first now once you have such a, a system that is good for screening then then you your resources are, are are free to to be more smart about what you do with everything else that you've got so yeah now now that you you can make sure that the people on the watch list are, are stopped and the people that um that uh, aren't can can move freely well, now you, you think about how do I build the, the better watch list? How do I make better use of, of the information available to me? So applying AI to, as we described earlier, you know, sort through that, that information from the OSINT sources to, um, mm -hmm. to look for new and novel uh, risks that are associated with it and maybe build a, a large model from the, the historical data and the decision-making that's happened. Um, you know, a, a supervised model plus an unsupervised model, you know, machine learned based off that, that data, um, combined with um, you know, a decision-making engine that's going to give your kind of future border guard uh, a better way of doing things. Because we think of border guards as, as, as people wearing uniforms, standing in an airport or standing at a port or at a, at a border crossing. But I think that in the future, that's, that's more going to be um, a role where somebody sits at a desk and understands you know, the, the general level of, of risk at any one time and uh, can drill down into the individual risk associated with people as they as they move. Um, so yeah, assisted by a machine that can bring the, the riskiest things to the top of their list. Yeah, can you give any examples actually of AI being used to sort of tip off border agents about a potential risk? I um I can I can give you um an, an interesting example. So I've got I've got a couple. So. I think probably you're all familiar with the, um, the limitations around taking liquids onto flights. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and what we, we were aware there was a Netflix documentary, like film documentary that, that, that told the whole story of the, the liquid bomb plot. Um, ultimately, the liquid bomb plot was a, a plot that was foiled by intelligence agencies. And um, when, you, when you watch the, the, you know, the film, you, you get to the point where they've already identified the the, the people that were um, causing um, you, know, you know out to out to cause harm, but the um, a lot of the hard work happened before that. So this was back in what 2006, I think something like that. Mm -hmm. There was um, there was already AI algorithms running against text postings on forums, you know, in the internet and in the deep and dark dark web. To identify risks against um, yeah, uh, against individuals and who could potentially become travelers. So, having AI engines that could read different languages, AI engines that could understand the um, the kind of the risky terms 
that, that might be mentioned and associate those with with people and times and flights were were um, were needed to to foil that particular plot. So it was natural language processing was applied on huge amounts of of collected data to pull out the you know the names of people and then the, the plot that they were trying to um, create. You know, and it wasn't it wasn't simplistic things. It wasn't words like bomb that, that were identified. Those, those are very easy with the keyword search. It's um you know it's having a semantic understanding of 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 individual languages. And being able to um, to determine, you know, the, the talk of, of chemicals in in you know a different language. Actually, those chemicals, when combined together, could produce a bomb. So it's 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 going that extra layer, which um, the natural language processing and text analytics can allow you to do. So that was one of the, kind of an early example of, of AI being used to trawl through large amounts of data to uh, mitigate a risk. Um, the, the second example is is not such a that doesn't have such a positive outcome. So, you know, with the liquid bomb plot, I think you know there were there were multiple planes and of the order of about two thousand people that were at risk who were who, who were saved by by that, that plot being foiled. But um, an example where there was a failure in a border system that could have been solved by AI is the, um, the Boston Marathon bombing. So, I think this was twenty thirteen, and um, there, unfortunately, there were two individuals, um, the San AF brothers who were actually already on the FBI terrorist suspect database. And they still managed to enter the United States at JFK Airport, travel to Boston and, and plant a bomb. So there was a failure there in the name matching system that they were using at the time. And after a Senate inquiry, it was understood that it was failure in the name screening capability that they had when it came to taking names written in Cyrillic, so wow. Russian names written in Cyrillic script and comparing them against an English watch list. So that, um, that system, after the inquiry and, and the identification of the, the hole in the, uh, in the border, because ultimately it was a hole in the border caused by a, a, you know, a lack of capability, that's when they, they implemented, you know, after um, some, some testing to prove that, that it could be filled, they implemented an AI a smart fuzzy name matching system. In fact, it was our AI-based smart fuzzy name matching system to secure um, secure CVP after that. So, you know, what we don't want is to have more more things like that happen that trigger a need for an AI algorithm. We want to kind of preempt that if if we can. But now you can know that that it won't happen again, right? The United States has has filled that hole uh, with the best technology available um, today. That just made me think, are you using linguists in your capabilities at all? If you're trying to, you know, do these translations and match language? I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, so um, in order to, to build a, a language model that's, that's appropriate for name screening or any of the other capabilities that, that we have around um, analyzing text, you need to have linguists that can train the machine. And they, you know, they need to take their knowledge and, and, and put it to, into a way that the machine can understand, uh, build an AI model off the, off the back of that. So I remember at, at one time within the Rosette team, I think we counted there was 37 different languages spoken across about 80 people, which was, was quite impressive. Wow. But, um, but also a lot, of, um, a lot of the language capability that, you know, that we use, the linguists that, that, that we might use, um, well, it, you know, it's about having a data team that can reach out to, to agencies and say, okay, I need, you know, I need, I need skilled linguists that can help me build this, this model, help me with this annotation task and feed that into, into the machine. So yeah, ultimately it comes from humans, you know, all of the, all of the learning that we'll, um, mm -hmm. uh, that we'll implement into something in the technology. That's fascinating. Yeah. I think just like with that sort of technology, you automatically think, okay, tech people are building this, but yeah. Just love to hear of my fellow liberal arts background people finding a <laughs> place here too. <laughs> no, it's it's a funny intersection, but you know, te technology and language, because yeah, often it is um, yeah, different different groups, but yeah, so they're quite hard. Sometimes quite hard to find somebody that does both, but actually, you can split the tasks such that the linguist can do the ling linguistic tasks, and the computer scientists can do the the um, the computer tasks. Awesome. Well, Declan, this has been super, <clears throat> sorry, this has been super interesting to me, you know, crossing AI and OSINT and, and with border security. Um, I want to thank you for your time. But for, before we go, is there anything else you want to add about Babel Street and artificial intelligence and how 
uh, you can assist boarders to basically to run more smoothly and travelers to be less bothered. <laughs> So um, yeah, Jeff, uh, you know I've really appreciated uh, you giving me the time to to speak today on the on the, on the podcast. Yeah, Jeff Aubrey, yeah, really appreciate your time. Now um, I think that kind of some of my my final thoughts around it is that we're not we're not done here. You know, it's not it's not that, that we have the perfect system yet. We don't have frictionless borders yet, and um, yeah, the, similar technology applies in, in other aspects of defense security and, and, and law enforcement too. They're, they're, they're not done and we're continually evolving. Um, I think that in the old days, we worried about having too much data. Um, you know, Big data used to be this buzzword that we were scared of, um, but now we've kind of tamed big data. Um, I think go, going forward, we're, we're gonna have to get smarter about what we're asking of the systems and what we want them to do. You know, it's. Um, it's a bit like in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's like, uh, you know, you find out the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. But but what's the question that, that you need to be asking? So um, I think yeah, there's there's a, a lot of a lot of thinking that, that, that still needs to be done. So we can envisage uh, the best possible outcome, the seamless frictionless border. But um, to get there, yeah, we can we can do better than we're doing now with the current point solutions. Um, but yeah, watch this space, right? So we are we're always trying to to innovate. Um, you know, we're always trying to bring uh, capabilities that are novel and, and unique from research, make them into capabilities that, that can be consumed uh, as enterprise software. And you know, we're not the only uh, you're not the only company in this space. You know, there's a there's a thriving community. Um, you know, we work in partner partnership with um, across um, across AI, across language, and, and, and complementary technologies. So yeah, watch, watch this space and and look out for for yeah upcoming announcements and look out for, for you know, for products and capabilities that, that, that appear. And yet we will continue to support this, um, this particular area. Uh, you know, we've got some, some very uh, loyal and satisfied customers in, in, the, in the border domain, and it's something that's um, close to our hearts. So yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I, I'd close with. Well, thank you again, Declan, for joining us today. Um, to our listeners, if you liked what you heard, uh, you can view transcripts and other episode info on our website, authenticate.com slash needlestack. That's authentic with the number eight dot com slash needlestack. And be sure to let us know your thoughts on Twitter at needlestack pod and to like and subscribe wherever you're listening today. We'll be back next week with more on how analysts can use emerging technologies. We'll see you then.